Hi, I'm Jamie Mitchell, and welcome to another episode of the Late Drop Podcast. Uh, before we get into today's uh, guest, I'd like to say that we uh, you can now go online and do just the audio version on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Google Podcast. So if you can't watch the video version, make sure you go and listen to the audio version. But today, we have none other than legendary uh, Big Wave Shaper, founder of the Big Wave Tour, Gary Linden, as a guest. Uh, Gary is uh, an amazing human being. He's the, he's the main reason that we're sitting here today even talking about a tour. He created the tour um, back about 15 years ago, uh, was able to uh, give it to the WSL and, and stay on as an advisor. Uh, he tells some great stories from growing up and how he got into surfing. So uh, I hope you enjoy the podcast. Well, Gary Linden, thank you. Thank you, buddy. Thanks for uh, joining me on the podcast. Uh, stoked to have you on. What a treat to be here, Jamie. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course. Um, where do I start with you? Incredible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where do we start why don't we start from the beginning uh that, that would be okay. cool because um i'd love to just um i think a lot of people would love to sort of see where it all started for you because if anyone's created a life around surfing it, it, it sure is you and um i'd love to sort of work out um how it started how how we got to be where gary linden is now so maybe i mean I know you're in Carlsbad, you're in around Oceanside, um, but were you born in California or were you born somewhere else? Yeah, I was born in the desert in California, El Centro in the Imperial Valley where, where the farmlands is. And, uh, and we got out of there when I was about three. And my dad moved us over to San Diego. So I, so I grew up in San Diego. And, um, you know, after traveling around and stuff and living in South America, living in Brazil and Ecuador, I moved up here to, to Oceanside, but such a long story, but I started surfing at 12. I started yeah. uh, contest directing for my surf club at 15 and I started shaping at 17 and that's all I've done all my life. You know, I just, that's kept, kept focus and try to stay surfing. Yeah. So what's, um, so you started surfing at 12 and how, how did that come about? I mean, obviously you're in California, in Southern California, there's lots of, lots of beaches, lots of awesome coastline. Um, was it something that you, was your dad a surfer or was it so, like a, something that a friend or a family friend got you into? How, how did you, how did you get into surfing? Well, um, you know, my dad grew up in Hermosa beach in the early teens in the twenties when that was the last stop on the train station in LA so he grew up, but they didn't have surfboards. You know, he, he did body surfing, learned to swim, and just hung around the ocean and stuff. And um, when I was about, I had childhood asthma, and I fortunately had a really great doctor. He goes, take your kid to the beach. My dad mm -hmm. was just going, oh, yeah, okay, an excuse for us to go surf, you know, the beach. So, you know, six or seven, we were, you know, once I could swim, we were learning how about riptides and riding the air mats and stuff like that. But um, when I was about 12, I went to a 4th of July uh, picnic up here in Carlsbad with my sister's boyfriend's family who came out from Arizona. And there was a surfboard, 4th of July picnic. I got to ride it. Well, I got one couple super rides and I was just hooked, man. So... I had a pa got a paper route and I made 20 bucks one month and bought an old balsa wood board and repaired it with my dad and just kept going from there. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was like most kids when they get that first wave, was it like totally hooked? Was that, ever, was it just like all you could think about, you know, like going to school, like trying to surf before school, like getting to the beach after school that did, did it sort of get the hooks in like that for you? Yeah, well, I, yeah, it got me hooked in like that, but I, we couldn't, we didn't live right at the beach, so we had like mm. lived about fifty minutes from the beach, so the options of going every day weren't always there. But I wanted to, I wanted to go. That's all I thought about, you know. We, so I started making skateboards, you know, with the steel wheels and a two by four, and and we land surfed for a while, you know, it was a long time ago. Yeah, classic. Get to go on the <laughs> <laughs> and so what um you know going you know obviously you're in high you're in high school at that time so 
you know, any other sports? Were you into any other sports stuff like that? Or is it really just, um, you know, like focused towards the beach and surfing and riding your skateboard or any, any of those sort of like, you know, typical American sports playing football, baseball? I played football, baseball and basketball. And, and mm. I, I excelled at all of them until everybody else grew and I did it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so linebacker on the football team, no, didn't work anymore. I couldn't even, wasn't tall enough to be a guard in basketball, but I've been all-star in all of them when we were littler. And then baseball, I was a, you know, all-star, but second baseman, cause that's where the shortest guy gets to play. And then I was playing pony league and the, the manager's son was smaller than me. So he got my position. So the manager put it on and I, and I'd started surfing before and I'm just sitting there, you know, on the bench, you know, and I, you know, going from being playing every day and then sitting on the bench and being better than the guy that replaced you was, it just got to me, you know, and I was just, I'm going to quit and go surfing. And my dad goes, I didn't raise a quitter. If you want to, yeah. don't want to play enough here. That's okay, but you're sitting there till you know till the season's over. I played another season, then that was it for the rest of the sports. I just I liked surfing because um, it was a sport, and that's important. I think th that I was a sportsman. It wasn't just a leisure activity. I, I like sports, but yeah. um, I like individual. I like surfing was an individual sport, and I could progress or regress at my own pace. You know, and I wasn't dependent on you know, somebody telling me I could play or couldn't play. But I think that really played into the fact why I was so determined to turn surfing to a sport, you know, because when I started, it wasn't, and there was no career path. So I think that yeah. was part of the motivation. Yeah. And so you're growing up and obviously you get to the end of like, would you say you started shaping at 17? Yeah. So that's sort of yeah. like at the end of like high school, right? So you start surfing at 12. You obviously, you know, you get better. Is, are there contests? Are you doing contests back then? Like back, are you, is that something that you get getting into as a kid or is it just purely just surfing? And then uh, how, did, how did you get from like surfing to shaping at 17, starting at 12? And then I, I'm guessing coming out of high school, um, then what was the, what was your thought train leaving that? Cause usually it's either like, okay, high school, you know, get a job, you know, I, I'd like to take, take us through that. Well, you know, you know it, the, the competition was via your surf clubs, basically. Um, so I joined the surf club and, and, uh, I, I became the competition director for, for my surf club. So I started ranking the surfers. That was when I was 15 and mm -hmm. compete and then i competed on the um western surfing association and you know in the amateur ranks i, I did pretty well and um then when i was 17 i got into wind and sea surf club and i started helping organize competition with them and i really learned how to organize a comp competition do all the pr and i did the high school surfing championships in 1967 and I started shaping because uh, Skip Fry was in, in our you know club, and he went to Australia and got a eight foot plastic fantastic Bob McTavish V bottom and brought it back from Australia, and everybody in our club got to try it and ride it. And we were all riding nine foot boards and all this, and then he got got on an eight foot board and it was a short board, you know, and nobody was making them. So Skip mm. made a copy of that board. And then I got my hands on the copy and got a blank. We could, it was re you couldn't even get a blank because you had to be a manufacturer to buy a blank. But Bear Miranda of La Jolla Surfboard sold me one out the back door, you know, a blank. And I shaped my first board copy in that, that V-bottom. And then I had an instant market because nobody was making them. So all my friends wanted me to make one. So I just started shaping from there. It's pretty wow. cool. So who, so who was so Skip Fry was your mentor? Like shaping was I mean because shaping to me like seems like a really hard. Um, I mean it's you need a lot of talent and uh, an eye for it, you know. But um, just it seems like just to be crazy, just like hey, here's a blank. I'm just gonna shape from start, you know. Like how 
was Skip or someone like that sort of like mentor you, show you the ropes, or you just went full, you just went into it by yourself when I'm just going to learn how to do it no matter what? Yeah, the first one, so I'd made custom skateboards in my garage, you know, so my dad had some tools and everything, and I learned to glue up blanks, gluing up skateboard blanks. I learned to fiberglass, and I learned to repair boards. So I was re- familiar with the process, sort of, but I shaped my first board in the backyard uh, of my house. And then my second one, now I did what I was, was sure for. My second one, we got a bunch of reject blanks from Floss Foam, my, my friend and I. And we were going to shape our own boards. And Tony Channon let us use Mike Diffender for shaping room. And I got to, you know, go in there. And we both started shaping. And my friend just destroyed the blank. And I had to go finish it. Mine came out pretty good. So he became the glasser and I became the shaper. But <laughs> the I, didn't, I didn't have any, um, I didn't have anybody to show me. I just, I just learned on my own. Wow. Yeah. And so this is, so this is out of high school now. Is that, is that, do you make a decision then that I'm just going to start, I'm just going to continue surfing and I'm going to uh, make some money from shaping and that's going to be what I want to do? Or was there any, is there any pressure from your, your mum and dad like to go get a, like a real job or how, how does this all start to play out at, at 17, 18 years old? Well, I graduated from high school at 18 and, you know, I was a pretty good student and my dad had told me, uh, when I was 14, he took me up to UCSB at Santa Barbara and showed me the campus, and it's right on this point break. It was really good. And he goes, if you if you get good grades and you do good test results, you can go to school here. And I'm going, it's on. So I got into UCSB, you know, and parked my van down on the point and had my board there and lived in the dorms. And first year went pretty good, and I kind of left the shaping, um, you know, aside and tried full on going to college. And, uh, and then that summer between freshman and, uh, so, freshman and sophomore year, I went to Australia for six months and, um, I, uh, lived with Greg Clough and Ronnie Woodward and, uh, Bob McTavish came up and shaped a board for Wayne Lynch where they're making boards up there at the, the cord factory in Caloundra. And, yeah. um, we had a summer of making boards. I went back to school in the fall, and uh, and then we had the spring. We had the riots on campus and for uh, the Vietnam protests and everything. And a student was killed, and uh, the bank burned down. And it was like so. We didn't have much school, so uh, I started shaping boards that that semester and. Um, then I just never went back to school. I just, I quit. I felt like I'm, I'm going to go. I mean, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life here, you know, in prison because we had martial law and it was crazy. You know, it was hard, hard times. My mom goes, if you're, if you're not going to go to school, then uh, you're going to get your education on the road. I want you to travel. So I yeah. just start traveling and um, yeah, do a little shit and, you know. Yeah. I was gonna. I was gonna say that because it. Um. It seems. It definitely seems like. Uh. You. You're one of the most. What or more well-rounded travelers that the surfing world has ever seen. I know Randy Rarick just lives just down the road from me, and I know that he's. He's traveled and surfed some incredible places as well. So, I mean, you must have got the travel bug early, right? And you know, you, you've finished school. You're surfing. You're, you're shaping boards. You can sort of shape boards nearly anywhere in the world. It's a great job to have on the road. Surfers are usually pretty um, transient and helpful. You can go and stay on the couch anywhere, you know. And um, so, so, that, so that's it. You know, the, the college thing's out the window. And then it's like, hey, I'm just going to start to travel, get street smart. And because um, it seemed like from a very young age, you um, had a a knack for you know organizing for um you know all that stuff you did at wind and sea surf club and stuff was there was there anything were you at this stage you thinking like hey i can do something like with surfing in, in that part of my life or is it more just hey i'm just going to travel surf have a good time learn learn along the way well you know i was still hadn't made the decision but uh right after school school i i uh, i traveled through mexico and central america by bus and train and 
you know, got my Spanish where I was pretty fluent in Spanish. And, uh, and I came back and I went to France in the fall and Mike Diffender for, was shaping there at Barlon factory in Bayonne, Buritz area. And, um, the board I'd shaped to take on the trip was just not holding up. It was good for, you know, week beach break, but the waves in France were powerful and I needed something more. So I went in to, to get a board, have diff shape me one. And, and that, I think that was what really changed things for me because diff was shaping two boards a day. And at the time got $25 a board, which that was a lot, 50 bucks a day. He had mm. a new Porsche, an orange Porsche. And he was just driving around you know, pretty living the life, you know, and I thought, man, oh man, you know, that's what I want to do. He, he'd just come back with tales from South Africa and all this stuff. And it, the world just kind of opened up to me at that point that that was a possibility. But, um, yeah, I didn't really, you know, I, I still had visions of going back to school at the time. And, but I went, surfed through France a couple months and Portugal and went out to the Canary Islands and, I was thinking, you know, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a sailboat from the Canary Islands and sail back to Florida and then go back to school. I, you know, I'm okay. I want to graduate because my my parents are pretty much adamant that I got a college education. You know, because mm. they, they they grew up poor and you know they they thought you know I'm gonna give my son and or my kids an opportunity. You know, and to just let it go was not happening. So. But I went down to the port every day trying to get a boat to sail on, be crew, and the only one that was was uh, would take take me on was this captain that was going to sail to Brazil, and he, this old wooden boat, thirty foot wooden boat, and just like I didn't know anything about it, I went, okay, let's go, you know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that week the motor broke the first night, and the, we got in force nine gale force winds the first day, so twenty foot seas broke the spreader. Took two months to get to Brazil. You know, we went through wow. the doldrums, two weeks in the doldrums, went without food and, you know, just crazy. But I got to Brazil. I spent six months there and I, and I actually started shaping. You know, so my life started. So I was shaping. There was a first foreign shaper to go there. And, and I, you know, I got 10 bucks a, a board, but it was enough to, you know, enough to pay for things. So I started getting a feel for this is going to work. You know, maybe this is going to work, you know. Maybe yeah, can do it. I, I did. I read somewhere that you actually uh, own a house in Brazil. Yeah, oh, you have, uh, oh, you I do. I, I do own a house and some land in Sacuarema, where the CT event now is. I, I found that spot. Um, we we're looking at the sailing charts, sailing across, and learned to celestial navigate and everything. And you see where the currents and everything are are, are going. And I just saw this you know, the way that Sacuarema sits out and I went, there, there's waves there. That's where the waves are. And, yeah. uh, I got there, spent six months there. And then I came back and spent two years here and went back and lived there and built my, built a house with my wife and I, and we still have it. So that's, wow. that's my play. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And so did you, did you end up actually, did you get your parents wishes? Did you actually end up finishing school after all this? <laughs> I don't know, you know, my dad, <laughs> I never finished school, you know, but my dad was, pretty, my dad was pretty, pretty proud of me in the end, you know, um, but I, I didn't realize it till uh, I had it, you know, in the 80s, my, my business went really good, you know, and I was top of the world, you know, I'm one of the best shapers in the world. And, and then the 90s weren't so good to me. And I had a lot of things that went wrong and I lost everything and I was really depressed and my dad came up one morning and he and he said to me he said, you know what's the matter i mean and i go well, sh dad you know this and that and he goes because you always want to live up to your dad's expectations and and if you love your dad and he's a good dad you want to be like him and he and my dad goes you you've done more than than i ever did you took our name all over the world and yeah. You know, so, so I, I, my mom, my mom's got other things. First, you got to be a male because she grew up on a farm and the male, the men worked. So you had to yeah. be a man. That was the first. You had to graduate from school and then you had to go in the military. And I only checked one of the boxes. Thank God I was born a man, you know? So yeah. she's proud of me. 
<laughs> she's proud of me, but I, I think she would have liked to see me do some other stuff. <laughs> uh, that's funny. And so, yeah. so um, at that stage, then you went to Brazil. Um, and at that stage, you you hadn't started actual Linden surfboards, right? Because you, I mean, that was that the name of the surfboards already? But when did did you you would have come back and then you? I mean, you still have the same shop in Oceanside, am I right? That you started like thirty or forty year, years ago, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I production. I made Linden surfboards all along, but I production shaped a Brazilian brand for two years when I was in Brazil. So I, I and then I went to Ecuador and production shaped balsa wood boards for mm, eight months and my first daughter was born there so i really I, i'd been shaping 10 years by the time i got back uh to the, U, to the u.s and um i got an opportunity to manage the brewer surfboard factory in oceanside which wasn't even a factory so we it was a old uh plastic fantastic uh factory and, but it wasn't set up. So my friend and I, who became my glasser when we first did that, he was still glassing. So we went yeah. up there and we set up a factory. And that was in 1978, and I'm, I'm still there now. Wow. But um, I made a deal with the guy that one of the – now Brewer Surfboard has been owned by a lot of people over the years, and the owner at that time um, had Joe Blair, Sam Hawk, Al Chapman – and Dick Brewer was shaping, and I told him, you know, I'll go up and I'll manage, but I got to shape too. I, I got to, I, I get to shape too, or else I'm not going to do it. Because yeah, I was good with the with my hands, or good with the tools. I could do it. I just didn't have the Brewer shape down. And uh, Joe Joe Blair really helped me, you know, get, you know get besides Brewer and you know you know and and Sam, they were putting out some great boards, but. Managing those guys was uh, was a handful, you know. I was just I a imagine. young kid. And those, those guys were the you know world heavies, you know. And I'm I'm having to <laughs> figure out the payroll and 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 get the boards out and and do my own work at the same time. But yeah, it was a, a fun times. And that was you started um, with seventy eight, nineteen seventy eight when it opened up in in Oceanside, yeah, and then. Yeah. Uh, there, there was a, a pack of kids in this area. You know how, how there gets hot spots? You know, at one point there was Santa Cruz and, you know, when, now it's San Clemente. But in that time, it was Carlsbad, Oceanside. So we had Joey Baran, David Barr, uh, you know, later Mike Lambrizi and on and on. But um, David Barr, I started shaping some boards for David Barr. And I started with these twin fins. And that's where my career really took off. And... Um, at, at that point, I created a Shape by Gary Linden logo for Brewer Surfboards. And then the shop started going, well, do we have to get a Brewer? Can we just get a Linden? And I said, well, yeah, that's okay with me. And yeah. <laughs> so I started making Linden Surfboards. I, that was probably around 79, 80 that, that started. Yeah. And at that stage, that that allows you to you sort of like get yourself a base. You sort of like okay, I've got the surf shop. You're managing that, doing that now. Oceanside, I've sort of got to sit down a little bit. I'm just wondering when um, all this transition into big waves, like we've you've, you know all this is where along the way did that was it a wave a trip. Or something where you're like, oh wow, like I I enjoy this, or this is what I really like to do. I'm wondering where in the timeline that that love affair for big waves kicks in. Well, I, I look at you know big wave surfing as more philosophy than an approach to your surfing than the size of the waves that you ride. So I was always the guy that wanted to catch the biggest waves of the day. Mm. Uh, so I always sat up. Side. You know, if it was two foot I, and there was an occasional four footer, I wanted to be the guy in the four footer. And so that all my career, that, that just progressed. And um, probably my first really, you know, 15 foot wave, you know, I uh, was in El Salvador and um, I, I went out at uh, Sinsal by myself on a 6'4 and caught a couple of huge waves and 
you know, then when I went to, to France, I was catching, you know, riding big waves in France at, at La Barre and in Guitry and some of the breaks there. And Canary Islands has some big waves. And then Saquarema has some solid, in Brazil, has some solid big waves. It's where all the big wave riders, the Brazilian big riders of the 70s and 80s, that's where they all lived and trained. We get... Well, they, you know, just, we get they, just, they just had a big swell then just recently, right? I've, I've seen a bunch of footage from the last uh looks like the last yeah. week there's been a ton of waves right there and a ton of there's a ton of slabs then there's the, the bright point break and looks like there's a ton of like lots of good energy that goes there yeah it the swell just races up it's funny it has an interesting dynamic it races up the coast coming uh from the south to the north and then and then the coast kind of hooks around after rio so the swell just comes right into the coast but you know there's a lot of it's it's some heavy water so um i i all my generation like sam hawk and al everybody they went to hawaii and everybody went there and i went to the hawaii in the 60s a couple times and um i just want to go someplace where there was less people but i still love the big waves um uh, i didn't surf waimea till uh, i was 33 and wow. i went i went there on a trip with um, you know after because I came back from South America, then I had two kids and, you know, I w I'd had to work and everything, so I didn't get out too much. But remember Dave Barr, Mike Lambrizi, and Mark Price and I went on a team trip to Brazil or to uh, Hawaii and, and Brewer loaned us his 9-1 single fin. And so we each went out at Waimea and, <laughs> caught, a few and caught, yeah, caught a few waves. And that was my first, it was big. I caught my first 20-foot wave you know, why 20 foot wave there. And, and me and Lambrizi really liked it and Dave Barr and, and Mark, Mark Price, not so much, but yeah. that's kind of where I started thinking, you know, I can do this, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. I like what you said about um, big waves is just getting the biggest wave of the day because it's, it's relative to where you grow up or what opportunities you have. It's not, you're not, and not everyone can grow up on the North shore of Hawaii or, you know, grow up on Maui or even like, you know, just be up in Half Moon Bay or Santa Cruz where Mavericks is around the corner or uh, it's, it's you know, I grew up in a place where it was lucky if it, like I grew up in Coffs Harbour, New South Wales, halfway between the Gold Coast and Sydney and we got waves but it wasn't, I mean, it'd be lucky if it was 10 foot faces was the biggest swell you would get, you know, or 12 foot faces but I was the same, like I just, like no matter how big it got, I wanted to just be out there, whether I was on my paddleboard or swimming or whatever it was, you know, and, and, and you just thought, ah, oh, the, the adrenaline of being out on the biggest day of the year, no matter how big it was, it could have been six feet if it was the biggest day of the year. It was like you had to, you know, I think that's relative when you tell this story a big ways because, you know, what everyone's doing now is so radical and it, it is so giant that it gets lost in translation to um, kids working their self up to get to a point of maybe surfing blacks or surfing todos or surfing sunset beach you know it doesn't have to be 180 foot belhera or 80 foot nazare or 60 foot jaws you know i think that's a i loved how you said that you know like it was even if it was four foot and there was a six foot set i wanted to get the six foot set i think that's a, a really a really good way of looking at things and and you have to develop that type of patience I think to be a good big wave rider else you're going to, if you're scrambling, you're never going to get any big waves. You're just going to get sit inside and get cleaned up and everything, but you got patience and you, you, you're used to sitting outside and learning how to read this, the ocean and in, in waiting for that big, that right moment and being in the right place. You know, you, it, it's got to start with that kind of philosophy. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm hear that that you're you're the same kind of thing i i didn't even care if that big wave came i didn't even care if i could make it i was just gonna go for it just see if i can make yeah. the drop yeah, out. Totally. i didn't care but. yeah <laughs> and so 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 that's uh so it seems like you had a real love affair with south america and um obviously you travel you traveled there a lot and you've got a house there and that's where you sort of were getting your sort of style of big ways but 33 you go to you know hawaii waimea I'm in interested because you had a um, – when was it that 
I'm, I'm wondering, I don't want to jump the gun like too much in timeline, but you, you were on the board of directors for the ASP for like 16 years. I'm wondering like from when, you know, you, you know, you're 33, you surf from Waimea, Linden Surfboards is going great. It's in Oceanside. When does uh, the transition into into this like management of um, surfing and getting involved more in the, you know, micromanaging of surfing and, you know, all that start? Well, you know, like I told you, like at 15, I was directing contests for my surf club. So um, when, when I had to choose a career, we went through a lot of how I chose a career. I would have liked to try to be a pro surfer, but that wasn't mm. available. And so I, I had to stay in, I felt I had to stay shaping boards to stay in with it. But I always wanted to um, pay back, you know, and, and, and try and give an opportunity to the next generation to not to have to shape surfboards or not to have to quit surfing, but to really have a career path. So um, I started judging when I came back from um, Brazil and I, I judged the IPS days. And then when uh, Ian started the, um, the ASP, I was a uh, contest director for the Stubbies. So mm. uh, the ASP concept was, original concept was every contest had a representative on the board of directors and it was matched by a, a surfer, uh, not necessarily from that event. So that there was an equal number of contest representative and surfers represented. So I stayed on in that capacity you know, as a contest director for the studies and later Lisa Beach and various uh, um, events. And, uh, and then I became vice president and uh, chairman of the board and, uh, as president for, for the last few years. But I, I always, I neglected actually I, my surfboard business to work on surfing. Uh, in 1984, I was part of the first four international judging team that was sent because what was happening is if you went to Australia, an Australian went. If you went to yeah. Peru, <laughs> if you went to South Africa, so we had, we had to get four uh, of the panel out of seven judges had to be international so that the local judges couldn't influence the decision. And I, I just left for two months in the middle of summer in 1984 to go on tour as a judge. And my Japanese customer was like, what are you Break doing? Linden? So, yeah. But you know, I'm still surfing. So I think I made the right choice. Yeah, for sure. And then, so when, <laughs> when along the way does that um, sort of bleed into an idea potentially of, a big wave tour, you know, you're, you're on the ASP for all those years. And then, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to try and work out when that thought, or, you know, you, you're seeing the, the tour, the shortboard tour, this and that, obviously your love for big waves is growing and, you know, you're traveling and surfing bigger waves. And, but I'm wondering, cause I know the Red Bull big wave Africa, you're a contest director there for about nine years, but I'm wondering when the little light bulb went off in your head and you went, you know what? Maybe, maybe there's a chance for a, a big wave tour or big wave events at least. I'm, I'm wondering sort of where that was along in the timeline. Well, after um, I had a surf shop in Hawaii in the early 90s, and uh, you know, I used to go over and shape, surf sunset all the time and shape, you know, and I just really, you know, furthered my skills in, in riding big waves. And, and uh, the Japanese economy fell out in the 90s. I mean, and I'd started surfing Todos in the late 80s. And when our shop had to close, you know, I was full on start surfing Todos. I mean, we'd go out there uh, for three days and we had no forecast. So we'd just take our three boards and ride whatever there was, you know. And yeah. I remember my ex partner in Hawaii calling me going, how come you're not coming over to Hawaii anymore? And I'm going, well, um, he goes, you're riding better ways with less people, aren't you? And I go, yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so um, we would go out there a lot, and, and there was just a small crew of us, and we'd sit around going, God, you know, we should have a contest out here, you know? If we each threw in 
you know, hundred bucks, we could have a thousand dollar prize money if we got ten of us or whatever, you know. And it, the ideas just started growing. And then in um, 1996, uh, the ASP was going to partner with uh, a company called CSI, and it was a, a marketing company based out of England. And they were going to hold; they wanted to hold an event at Toto's. Mm. And so I spent. Graham Cassidy was the executive director at the time, and I spent, you know, two years getting the whole thing organized. Oh, what a nightmare, too. We were going to have, like, a whole CT event with, and a women's at Toto's with no forecasting. It was, like, crazy that we were thinking of doing it. <laughs> and that was going to be held in 1997. I still got the trophy, some the original trophy. Sometimes I, I want to show you that. but. Um, wow. They, we were going to have it in February, um, and we had the board meeting, and the cert first had to sign off on this this uh, relationship with CI, CSI, and they weren't getting it signed. And they, you know, and I'm waiting. Are we? Are the contest on? Is the contest on? And every morning I would call in Sid his time at the night. You know, is it on? He goes, no, Wait, call me tomorrow. You know, and um, it. It ended up the surfers didn't want to want to do the the deal, so the contest was called off. But I had everything in place, and the ISA came along, and they wanted to do a team big wave challenge. So they go, okay, let's let's do it. And so that was in 1998, and that was the year that uh, Taylor Knox caught his uh, K2 fifty thousand dollar wave. So that was a different. So the the K two challenge was a year round for just the biggest wave, but the but he caught it in the teams event, right? He caught it in the teams event in the semifinal. Yeah. Yes, yes, and, yes. And um, and the the next year we did it again, but but the waves were kind of small, as uh, well, they were a lot smaller, but um, because. Uh, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't predict it. So I always used to go a oh, medium tide in February. And that I thought was the best chance of getting the waves. And we'd bring everybody from around the world and they'd stay there two weeks. And so we just didn't catch it. We got lucky the first year, but, uh, Cass Collier and Ian Armstrong won that year. And they're from Cape town and yeah. they were just dominant. I mean, they were they were playing in the waves. It wasn't very big, like I said, but you know they were playing in it. And I thought, damn, they must have a lot of good surf in Cape Town. And I'd been there before, and I'd seen dungeons, and you know, looked out from the around the mountain or from the Chapman's Peak, and all the sharks and all this stuff. And I was, I don't want any of that. I don't want anything to do with it. But they got they went back, and they were sponsored by Red Bull. They went back to South Africa. And the third year we had the, the World Team Challenge, we had it in Madeira. And once again, we didn't get, we didn't get the waves and, you know, it, you know the momentum kind of lost. But Cass, Ian, and Mickey Duff as their coach had convinced the people in Red Bull to do this Red Bull event, Red Bull Big Wave Africa. And the first year... Uh, it didn't go too well. Mickey was the contest director, and Mickey calls me. and goes, "I just want to surf. I don't want to. I want to deal with this. Will you come over and be the contest director?" And so yeah, that started, uh, you know, a nine, like you said, a nine-year run of, you know, looking back, it's probably some of the best moments of my life. You know, for for three weeks, Red Bull paid for house, food, car, gasoline, and all we had, all we were supposed to do, was surf. And go out at night and represent Big Whale, uh, Red Bull. And I got to live the life of a pro surfer for three weeks a year. <laughs> you know? good, my dream, my dream was short, but, but it, it, it got <laughs> fulfilled. You know? so, but that's where, that's where I started um, we know, testing the interference rule. Um, the, the, we doubled the biggest wave in big wave competition. And that came from T Taylor Knox's big wave because in the semifinal, he caught that huge wave, which was a 10, but to line that wave up, he, he got pitched on the first one. And one of the judges wouldn't give him a point and a half for the, for the wipeout. So he didn't get to the final. 
And I thought, yeah, man, crazy. you know, I, I, the, the, what we're looking for is seeing the bi biggest wave ridden. So if we double a 10 and you get a one, you got 21. And if you get two sevens, you get four, double seven, 14, seven, 21. You count back to the biggest wave. So a 10 beats two sevens. And so I thought that was a fair way. So the guy could actually sit outside and wait for the big, biggest wave that rather than sit inside and scramble to get a six and a seven and something like that. Because Taylor's wave got 26 front covers around the world and whether newspapers or magazines or whatever. So the public, we weren't broadcasting in those ways. The public was going to see that. Well, did he win the contest? Yeah. Well, he didn't even get to the final, you know? So you kind of want to represent what happened in the water in the results of the competition. But anyway, I had a good run with, with, uh, with Red Bull in Africa. So we got to test some of the rules and, and Maverick started up the competition in 2000. So in 2000, we had Red Bull Big Wave Africa and we had Mavericks to, you know, really keep it going. And um, so I, I had, I made this pitch, you know, and all I translated it to Portuguese and I was just going around trying to get somebody to believe in the Big Wave Tour. And I realized that, you know, without proof of concept, nobody's going to give you any money. And I'm, I'm sitting in Africa in Cape Town and, and watching uh, Breaking Down the Door. And I went, oh, okay, IPS days. Just link all the events that are happening and we'll have a tour. So I already had uh, Red Bull, Big Wave Africa, it had Mavericks. Ramon Navarro was you know, sponsored by Red Bull and Quicksilver at the time. And I, and I goes, yeah, I can do it. We'll get one in Chile. I flew to Peru. And they had the Billabong uh, Pico Alto. And I, what I would do is I'd promise every event that was existing that I'd bring the best six big wave riders in the world to compete against your um, top 18. 18 locals. The 18 locals. And then as the locals, if they did well, then they had a chance to qualify for the tour. So it, it, it worked. And... Uh, it was pretty fun. You know, we had some good times, man. It was, yeah. it wasn't the money that, that we were looking for, but, but the competition, we, we learned a lot. Yeah, no, there was a lot of contests and I mean, um, and then you add in the Oregon contest that, that, that came in at some stage as well. Nelscott, there was a, I mean, Punta Galea. Um, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I still remember to this day, um, I, you know, I'm not sure how long ago it was, but, it was the Punta Galea contest and I hadn't been in an event yet and I was desperate to get into an event and the, the, you guys called the contest on it. It was really close to Christmas. It was like maybe like around the 20th of December and um, I remember calling Pete Mel saying, Pete, can I, you know, can I, can you ask Gary, can I get in the contest and this and that and, and um, I remember getting the message back going, hey, um, nothing's guaranteed but so there's some people not coming. So if you show up, you might get in. <laughs> and so I took the chance. I took the chance. I wanted it, I wanted it so bad. I, I, I took a last minute flight to Spain and got there, got into the event, um, made the semifinals, uh, missed out by one. Ramon got a left in the last 20 seconds to beat me to get in. But that got me into the Nelscott contest, which I made the semis again. And that got me, um, that got me onto the tour. So yeah. from a, you know, from a, you know, and, and we all knew that's how it sort of works. You know, you just, you were waiting for your opportunity and, and, um, and you just had to take it or, or you had to so and go out and get it yourself, you know? And that's, I mean, that's the way I did it. I, I remember like waiting for my opportunity and I just said to myself, whenever I get some sort of chance to even try and get there, it's like Mavericks, right? They said, go out. In before the final, uh, before the contest, get a wave and go out in between the semi and the final and try and make a name for yourself, you know, try and get that wave and that would be nearly how you would maybe get yourself into the contest, you know, and uh, those days were fun, man. I, I remember that, that, that I mean, that, that's the information that I got. It's like get out there before the contest starts, try and get some waves, get some waves after it, in between it, however you can and 
you know, hopefully you just pick off a good one and every, everyone sees it and all of a sudden your name's in the memory bank. Yeah, it was it was the only way we can do it. Speaking of Nell Scott, I've I got a, a photo of uh, you, me, and Chris Burdish on the same wave in one of the heats in between. So it's like, a, that's a good memory. Yeah. That's those, those cool. Chris Burdish. Yeah. Yeah, there's been some amazing, amazing people from, um, I mean, the big wave community. Uh, there's some just have done, there's some individuals that have done some amazing stuff. I mean, Chris, Chris being one of them, um, that story of him winning Mavericks, um, you know, his just last minute flight, gets in, borrows a board on the 2010 day, which is the biggest, still to this day, one of the gnarliest contests of all time. Um, Pre flotation, all that stuff, and then um, wins that contest. And then for him to go and do that trans uh, Atlantic solo sup paddle, um, yeah, that, that guy's a, a special, special breed of South African. <laughs> you know, he, he was he was one of the best guys at, at Dungeons, and but he he never one of those guys that didn't have enough patience to win. You know, he he would he would just take off on these closeouts and pull into them, and, and so he really learned had to learn how to compete. I used to have to pull him aside and go, "Chris, you're gonna win, but you gotta get the best waves," you know. And so it's there was a lot of learning to do. It was a fun, it was a fun time. Like it was pre flotation vests, and you know, people really had to had to really show some initiative to to get in there. Alternates always got in Be- because there was not much prize money because there, uh, this and that difficult to get last minute. You really had to show some desire and really want it. And so we, it evolved that we re- had a really special crew of people. And, uh, and I'm so thankful uh, having to be able to experience all that with you guys. Yeah. And there's that, and there's wow. that, that, that classic story too of um, I think, I wasn't in the contest. I remember I was on the Gold Coast because it was really late season. Me and Pete, um, Pete was commentating. We're at the Quicksilver Pro. That's the first event of the year, obviously, in Snapper. And it's usually the end of February, March. And I remember Pete was there um, working. I was there doing the water water patrol and the jet skis. And the, the swell popped up. And I think it was the one that, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I think Greg maybe put up some of his own, you, you and Greg put up, uh, your own money to maybe run that one and it was the year that Healy won I think it was the one that Healy won and he won a bottle of tequila <laughs> yeah that was our our, um, our event at Totos and, and we yeah, had a Totos. sponsor we, we had Peligroso tequila and uh, and at the last minute I go they pulled no no that was not Peligroso it was we had Monster we had Monster was our sponsor. We had a fifty thousand dollar commitment from him, and they pulled out at the last minute. And Greg and I went, "Well, do we gonna run or we?" You know, he goes, "You know, I'll, I'll give you five thousand, You know, and you yeah. know, we pitched together and, and and had the event. And so thankful that we did because Healy and um, he, yeah, well, that was fun, man. It wasn't the bottle of tequila. That was one of the best times ever. Dude. That was so much fun. Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> but but it's, really, it's so really funny. Cool. That, the, the, the thing that's funny about that to me was that I never lived it down. So the prize money from the Big Wave World Tour was always a bottle of tequila. You know, you know that's, <laughs> that's what everybody said, you know. So there, but heck, I used to bring a bottle of tequila every event. So <laughs> we'd have one. <laughs> so when when does um you know we go through those those times are awesome and you know there, there is a tour and um you know certain events you know they go off and they're great events it's I mean it's so hard to get a year where there's every event goes off and there's seven events in a year but when when do you start to think about you know the the world surf league comes along when, when is there a, a thought or a transition of um you know, potentially pitching what you created to those guys to see if they want to run with that? Well, um, when they, Sosi uh, took over the ASP, um, Terry Hardy and Paul Speaker, 
uh, they approached me and said they wanted to take over the Big Wave World Tour. And um, you, you've got to remember that the Big Wave World Tour was funded by what I made off of Linden surfboards, which, yeah. which obviously wasn't much. And uh, I didn't have insurance for any of that either. So like my whole, my house, my, my livelihood, my everything was on the line for five years. And uh, I was pretty, pretty crazy that, that I was even willing to do it. Like I was risking family's future and everything. And um, I just, I was just doing it to keep it alive because it was my dream. You know, the, the, yeah. I, as a big wave surfer with, you know, that didn't have a, a chance to be really a big wave surfer when professionally or anything. It's just like, it was so special and so important to me that I was willing to risk everything to keep it going. But there, this opportunity came along um, to actually have it funded and, and potentially, I thought, take it to another level, which they did. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to sell the tour, but, but I, w I was given a job, a guaranteed job for two years. So it was pretty, it was pretty good. I mean, I, I felt like, wow, what a success, you know, that, that what we was created is, has come to this level. And we had some, some really great events, but you, you know, you're talking about, um, being able to run an event at every, every place. Well, I, I'd created, a, a rating system for the size of the waves. So we had bronze, silver, and gold, depending on the size of the waves so that there was a minimum of, of 15 foot you could run and you'd get bronze. So that yeah. I figured every every spot in the world, one day at least had some 15 foot waves. You picked the right spot, and it was pretty good. So I, I guaranteed uh, a 60 percent run. So that if I, I had yeah. five contests, and I would guarantee we'd run three events. And sometimes we ran under what people would have liked, but nobody ever really regretted running an event. I think that the re in, end result where the waves were were good enough but when the uh, ASP took over they were investing so much money that that they wanted it to be another level and we switched from having it run by uh, administrators like myself to surfer run so Pete Mel became the commissioner and then the commissioner would make the call and it was really a lot of pressure on Pete because he had had no experience making the call. He'd had experience surfing in it. So he was looking at it from a surfer perspective and it's hard from a surfer perspective because you want the best waves possible to showcase your talent. You weren't looking at all the, all the aspects of the, you know, the sponsors need to run, the events need to run and this and that. So it got kind of difficult. So, it made making the call a lot more difficult. And so there was a learning curve for Pete and a learning curve for the ASP. And it, it, uh, it, it became a difficult uh, scenario to, to manage yeah. where you had enough of it. Yeah. I, yeah, I want to, I, I, I want to go back to, I think at the start of the conversation, the podcast, you said that, um, you know, you're an athlete competitor and you like the competitive aspect. And I think that's one thing that you have um, kept, you know, like with SERP, you wanted, you wanted there to be a winner. And I think I remember you saying that to, to, we had a meeting and you're like, Hey, cause there's, there's been other formats, you know, like the Eddie, which is an awesome format for that event, you know, where everyone serves twice and it's a celebration and there's a winner at the end. But but I remember you saying, like to me, uh, to you, Jamie, this we want, we need this to be a sport. There's you know, people are going to win, people are going to lose, and at the end of the day, someone's going to hold a trophy up, and they're going to be the winner. That's that's a, that's a sport. It's a sport. I want I want big wave surfing to be a sport, and I and I never forget that because um because I you were very staunch on that on that on that fact. You know, like it's we we can't have these events that are the it's just that you know we're going to give them prize money for the biggest wave or the best barrel or whatever it is it's got to be people are going to win lose and eventually there'll be there'll be a winner at the end of the day and um and i think that's what 
was I, you know, able to transition over to the, you know, from what you created to then, you know, the WSL? Well, thanks for recognizing that, Jamie. I know you, you're multiple world champion and, and you're paddling and everything. And, you know, if you don't have a world champion, it's not considered a sport that in the world's view, I think. And so that, that was really important to me. And, um, and the Eddie format is really good because it's a celebration of a big wave surfing unequal in, in any other thing. But it's like Ross Clark Jones said to me, he goes, he, All right, Gary, I don't want to compete anymore. I was invited in one of the contests. And I go, well, you just, you just won the Eddie. He goes, well, no, that's, yeah. that's a celebration, man. That's not competition. You, you, you want to be able to compete like man on man, equal playing field in a heat, you know, dog eat dog and you know just that that's what's thrilling to an audience i think as as well as a sportsman you, you, there's a rush there's a general adrenaline rush to winning i mean if you've, you've ever won whether it's the yeah. whatever it is you know holding that trophy is like that's about as good as it gets you know and yeah, uh or if you tequila you know it's it doesn't matter yeah. it could be a hundred well, you still won. You still won. You still won. So you're still the winner. That that feeling's the same. Yeah. No. I think that's yeah, really I tell important. My wife, to... Yeah, I told my wife one day. She's like, she goes like, what? Like, why? Like, what? Why do you want to keep doing this? Or why do you keep on to win? And I, I said, well, have you have you ever won, darling? I said, it's it's you know when you win something, it's 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 very very addictive and it's very very rewarding you know it could be depending on what it is it could be anything but the time and effort that you put into uh, to achieve a goal no i don't care what it is because again if you're talking about a two foot wave to a 20 foot wave everyone's perspective of what that is is different and um you know and same with sport you know um it's it doesn't matter but you know if you've put that same time and effort in as a as say a michael jordan did to win his championship you might be winning the millions and millions of dollars and be the most famous sportsman in the world but you still get that deep down feeling that he does there's no doubt about it you go home at night you look yourself in the mirror and you're like proud of yourself and you feel good about yourself and that there's something about that feeling and there's something about trying to achieve that whether you win lose or draw you know trying to get to that process is a, is a, is a really amazing process. But, um, you know, you look like guys like Billy Kemper, you know, like that guy's a competitive animal, you know, and then you look at guys like Greg Long, who's the exact opposite, but they have both had great success, you know, and I'm sure that they both, you know, you look at those two guys and they're completely opposite spectrums of humans, but, you know, I'm sure that deep down, you know, when they're alone, they get that same feeling of like, Yes, you know, like we, I, I did it, you know, like even though it's sort of, um, you know, transformed and shown in the public a little bit differently. You put that jersey on and you turn into an animal and I don't care who you are, you know, yeah. <laughs> you just, you want to win, you know, and it doesn't matter. Like even if you win a heat, sometimes that you don't even have to win the contest, but just that feeling that you, you were able to, to connect with all the conditions and and show yourself that you were the best you could be at that moment and i know like you bring up billy camper and i know you you've been a professional athlete all your life and and you train learn to train early you know and and billy just like i had no idea or i had to spend some time with him in morocco this year when he hurt himself before he hurt himself listening to his training program and it's not by accident that he's you know, got to such acclaim in the big wave community. You guys put in a lot of work and the winning is that's your reward. And that pushes you to go back into the gym and back to your trainer and go, yeah, I did it once. I'm going to do it again. And, and, and that's one of the things I really wanted to, to see with a, with a, with a tour, with a big wave world champion is how far can we push this sport? We'd never seen, it wasn't a sport. It was basically guys over 40 that had enough money to, to get some big wave boards and to travel when there was a swell. There was no 18 year olds, there were no 20 year olds, there were no 30 year olds at the prime of their athletic uh, career out there competing. So we didn't, you know, we could take off and turn at the bottom and wow, everybody would applaud. We weren't seeing 
things like Billy Kemper pulling into a 60 foot barrel or, or Twiggy, you know, the stuff and what you're doing. And, you know, it's just, it's just so amazing. I'm so happy. Yeah. To, to be to see that participate in that. Yeah. And so how was, well, I mean, there, there obviously some challenges like with the WSL, like you said, with Pete, I mean, I became the surface rep after Greg stepped down and, um, I'm, you know, I've been on a bunch of those calls as well. And, you know, it's a, it's a learning process for me as well. Um, and you do look at it from a different perspective. Once you've heard, once you've listened in on those calls and you're on them and the pr production teams on them and sponsors and you're trying to run an event, you know, there, there is a, a definitely a different perspective from just being the surfer, you know, wanting to, run or run on the best conditions of the day and trying to pick a swell maybe there's not going to be another swell after this one you know so there is a lot of stress on that but i mean overall those you know those those few years that we you know that, that there was the tour and we're all part of it like did it go the way that you thought it was going to go were, were you happy with that end result you know like i mean there's been there's been some amazing moments some amazing events you know the first nazare event and you know what's been happening it, you know, it seems like every year at jaws is a pretty monumental um jaws swell super bum we didn't get a mavericks one in in, in that in that time frame that would that would have i think that would have blown people's mind to be able to you know the way that the production was running to be able to shoot into the bowl and see the guys doing that would have been blown minds as well uh, that's one of my biggest like it's not a regret because I didn't have anything to do with it, but I just, in the whole scheme of things, I wish we had got a chance to surf Mavericks on a real swell with that type of production and backing, you know? Yeah, that would have been amazing. That's unfortunate that that, that didn't happen. Um, you know, I guess your question, am, am I happy? Uh, I, I'm really happy because uh, the WSL experience, we really elevated – the stature of the sport, the prize money, the expectations, the production. I mean, it was just absolutely phenomenal. It was a pity that we weren't able to make it sustainable. Um, that that yeah. we, we, we didn't, um, we did, we didn't get the support from the, the financial community that, that would like to have, but, um, it's established, you know, we're just going through a phase right now. There's something else will emerge. It didn't die. I mean, we don't have a tour right now, but but it it'll come back and it'll come back and it will it'll each time it uh, it'll be a little bit better. It'll be we we'll have a little bit of time right now to think of, of what we where we want it to go and how we want to do it. And you know, um, I, I'm just so thankful. I mean, if the WSL hadn't have taken it over for me, I don't know if it would even be alive. Would have passed that year that the last year I had it because like I was just pretty much at the end, you know, of, of my yeah. ability to sustain that. So, um, yeah, I, and I learned a lot and I think, I think you guys as surfers learned a lot about, you know, being in there and on the call. I know Pete learned a lot, like after three years, he, he knew what was going on and he, you know, and, yeah. and, and it just was too stressful for him to keep on. Then Mike Parsons came in, had to go through the same process and it was just yeah. got to be too stressful, you know, cause, as a surfer that, you know, I, I'm a surfer. I, I always would paddle out before the, I was committed to being able to ride the waves I was calling the contest on, but I was looking at it from different viewpoint. So I could, I could balance the aspects, uh, I think a little better. And I, th I think yeah. we learned that, that we need to, it, it, those decisions need to be made by people that are administrating the event. You know, and the surfer should have a vote like the surfer's rep, but it should be like the contest director, the surfer's rep and the the production staff or something like that. A, you know, three headed uh, voting decision. And and I think we learned that, but you wouldn't learn it like if you didn't do it and, you know, try to see how how hard it was. So, yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy where we're at. Yeah, yeah I'm, I, I, you know, I. I know that we. I know that it seems like things are in dire straits, but I, I truly believe that the best is yet to come for um, for Big Wave. I think that uh, I'm really um, excited actually about what's. I think what's going to happen in the next few years. So um, yeah, it's going to be insane. 
it's keeping me going. I'm 70. I'm still stoked. I want to, I want to participate in, in building it back up, man. I'm looking forward to it. I we'll do I it. I can get a wild card, wild card into the event. Uh, um, I, those days, uh, my big waves is not <laughs> as big as they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's talk about that because I, you did get a wave at Jaws at 65. Were you 65 when you got your, I mean, that's pretty impressive, yeah. Gary. Come on. You know, I was pretty stoked on that, you know, and, and the fact that Pete didn't call the event, we were over there and it, the swell still held, I'll forever be indebted to Pete for that opportunity. But because I, I didn't ever think I was going to get to ride Jaws and uh, because, you know, to, to do that properly for me, I would have had to go over there and spend some time and bring my board and do everything. And I just, I'd only go over there to run the event. And so the day before I was too busy and the day after got to be too dangerous. You know, you're all tired and you paddle out and you wouldn't be prepared. But I got to sit there in the channel on the boat and I brought my, my, my wetsuit and, and my vest, but with just on the odd chance that I get to surf and, and Ben Wilkinson came by and he's looked at me sitting in the boat and I've been watching for two hours and he goes, you're frothing to have a surf, aren't you, mate? And I go, yeah, but I don't have a board. And he goes, well, I'll lend you one. And he's, so he lends me this 10-4, like, thicker than heck. And I figured, okay, well, I don't know how that board's going to work, but I'm going to at least catch a wave. And I knew exactly right. by watching it. Yeah. I knew my exactly where to sit because I'd been watching. I knew which one I wanted. I did. I knew I didn't want to get one off the north. I didn't want to get one off the, the West Bowl. I wanted to get one right there in the middle, and it was clean and glassy. So paddle right out. My wave came. I caught it. I, I couldn't turn the board to make the end section, but, you know, Scott Eggers came over and picked me up, and he goes, you want to go out again and get another one? I go, no, I'm done. <laughs> I caught my yeah. wave. That's all. But that's, I mean, that, that's know, like that winning, it's like winning the contest feeling, right? You know, you just, you just won that, oh. you just won your mental contest, uh, like a goal of like your life, you know, like a, creating everything you crave for big wave and being a big wave surfer yourself. And obviously father time stops for no one, but uh, you've obviously kept yourself in great shape. You live a good at lifestyle and it allows you to go out and get that wave, you know? You know what the what the greatest thing for me is like, you know, all my friends were in the channel, all the people that I'd worked with on the tour and everything that I really had admired and respect were hooting and clapping and, you know, just made me feel like I just won the contest, you know. Uh, and Paige Alms got a barrel that day. I think the first woman that ever got barreled and she got the same kind of reaction and I just went, Man, what a reward. Uh, there's no money that can buy this feeling. That's the cool thing, right? Like when everyone is sort of there as a team, your production, you got the water safety and the water guys and all those guys, and they're so stoked to see like us get waves and then for them to come in safe. But to see someone like yourself, you know, get that wave and have everyone cheering in the channel, you, you sort of kick out, you sit on the boat, you're so stoked, and you, then you get to watch the rest of the show. Yeah, it was it was pretty epic. It was like it was the reward, you know, for for all the hard work I did I had done, and you know, I I know everybody really appreciated all my work over the years, you know, and give the opportunity of creating the Big Wave World Tour. But you know, sometimes you felt alone too. Mm -hmm. But but at that moment, I realized, you know, how much love there was out there for for me. You know, and yeah. it just, it was phenomenal. Yeah, it's awesome. That's so yeah. cool. Siza, um, what, I'd like to get your perspective on what what's the future of, I mean, not not sort of the, the big wave tour or anything like that, but just big waves in general. I mean, there's been, you know, we've got some amazing young kids coming up, um, you know, Lucas Chumbo from Brazil and obviously what Kai's doing and then you've got um, – uh, Luca from Half Moon Bay, and there's a bunch of young kids there. Like, where where does where does Gary Linden see the future of big waves compared to you know what you've seen from when Taylor Knox caught his wave? Because there is sort of some restrictions. He's like, there's only so much you can do, but then there's all then then there's you see things happening, and you're like, wow, 
that is really next level? Well, let, we, let's go back to, to, to Billy Kemper and yourself and, and the degree of training. You know, I still don't think we've seen um, the highest level of athleticism possible for big wave riding. Like Luca Padua is training with Laird Hamilton right now. And, you know, he's young, so he's, he's probably got the, at the forefront. But I think if there was a lot of people training to the degree that Billy Kemper trains, I think mm. we would really, really see a next level jump because there's yeah. so, so many people. Like I didn't train at all. The only training I could do was go, you know, surf as much as I could. That was the only training. I didn't go to a gym or anything. So we could only get so far. And then the size of waves got bigger and bigger. And you see what Jaws is. Jaws is perfect, even bigger than what's been ridden. And, and, but we've seen it getting bigger, ridden bigger than we've ever imagined it could be ridden. Like that, that barrel of Billy's and, you know, what Twiggy did and, you know, that one year in the, yeah. in the event. And I mean, those things were uncomprehensible for me w when I was younger. I mean, it was before I saw it. I couldn't believe it was it was happening. So I think that by increasing the quantity of big wave surfers, growing the big wave community as a culture, we're going to see people in Morocco riding big waves, in Ireland, and all over the world that are you know now it's a viable thing. You know, if we can keep the sport going in some way for these kids to make some money so that they can train instead of going to a nine to five job we're going to see waves that we didn't know existed that are bigger and better it's hard to imagine a better wave than jaws but we didn't imagine riding nazare 10 years ago either so um we're going to see this thing and i think with the training we're going to see another jump and from that jump i don't know i i, I don't know but i think there's within the next 10 years there's going to be as big a jump as we've seen in the last 10 years yeah Just because that's a good I, point I, yeah I, I, that's a good point because i think that you know you have the talent right so you could i mean imagine like um imagine getting gabriel medina to surf big waves right like you know i mean like there's talent level that like certain things could be done on a surfboard at a top level like that put him on a nine six that they could do it right but to be able to actually physically mentally have the training the experience that's when like you're saying that's that's what needs to be done like you've got to have the right water safety like towing surfing had its place it, it allowed everyone to understand how much you could wipe out on by getting towed into big yep. waves and also allowing you to go and rescue someone that has taken a bad wipeout. now if you have that team that's ready to do that then you have an athlete that is trained harder than anyone's ever trained before. I mean, Led was the perfect example. He was a, you know, he was way before his time. But you know, you've got these guys like Billy and other kids, and you know, it's the the mental capacity and the physical capacity to paddle out in that moment to want to put yourself in that position of life and death and huck yourself over the ledge without having that confidence the ability, the training, the safety, the level's not going to go up because you, you're you just going to see the same size waves being ridden. Um, mind you, there's going to be different lines drawn. There's going to be shorter boards and all that sort of stuff. That That's fine. But I think what you said with the training is and, um, the you know, the mental training and, and understanding what, what you may be capable of is more than that guy is capable of because you've been putting in the work. I think that's, that's going to be a... A, a thing that we can look at over these next this next next decade to see the the level jump. Yeah, when we, and we have trainers and and people like Billy, you know, retire from surfing and and starts training somebody like Laird's doing, you know. Yeah. It, it, and you, and yourself, you know, that know how to train, that know how, you know, professionals that really focus in. And, and I keep talking about it, but Billy has such an amazing uh, routine that that I I would love. To have him as a coach, I mean, yeah, if, yeah. if I was, well, a, he, has, um, he has he has Kahaya Hart, and Kahaya Hart's a, a unbelievable surfer. He's yeah. surfed giant waves, you know, all around the North Shore. So you've got, you know, you've nearly got that guy there. You've got a guy that was a professional surfer back in the day, 
charged giant waves, knows, understands the mechanics of surfing and has went and done his training to become a trainer, you know, so you've nearly got that guy already, you know, that, that's training yeah. Billy and you can see the benefits. Yeah. And then Billy's got a nutritionist, you know, that tell, you know, yeah. how many grams of this and how many grams of that do I put in my body? And he sleeps in a hyperbolic tent so that yeah. the, it's, I mean, it's just, it's incredible. And, and it might sound excessive to some, but that's what it's going to take. I mean, the waves that we're trying to ride right now are almost beyond humanly possible. So you've got to be this, you know, prepared human uh, version of yourself that 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 you can be. And and I really think like Italo uh, Ferrer, our current world champion, Lucas Chianca took him out to ride some big waves in in Sacuarema the that last well. He was doing pretty good. I mean, well, I mean, I'm I, sure you could do it, like you said. And he, I saw him towing it. He went, actually went to Nazare and towed into a couple there as well. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's just a matter of desire. But he's going to have to stop spinning the airs and and putting yeah. in some time and developing those aspects that you were talking about. That you know, do I really want this? Because you got to really want it. That yeah, that, definitely. You, you can't hesitate. Yeah, cool. All right, Gary. Well, I'm going to finish. I'll finish off the podcast uh, with five questions. Um, it's okay. called the five to fin- five to finish. Um, number one is, what is the best big wave in the world? Uh, I'd say Jaws. Okay. Yeah, that's a common a common answer. <laughs> um, the this this is sort of like a two edged short. The heaviest or scariest big wave. Probably Nazare. Yep. Yep. So much water, the cliff. Um, yeah. What's one wave that Gary Linden ha- – what's one big wave that Gary Linden hasn't surfed that he'd love to surf? Oh. Well, I've, I've, I've been out and caught a couple of waves at Nazare, but I haven't been out when it's huge. And I've caught one wave at Jaws – but I didn't get barrel like Billy, and and if if I could get it, I, <laughs> if I could get one of those barrels at Jaws, I think that's probably what I'd like to do. Just get yourself a hyperbaric chamber, mate. I, I I'm gonna I'm get you you laugh, but I'm gonna be yeah. talking to Billy once it gets better. Yeah, that's awesome. Old um, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, what what is the the big the most underrated big wave in the world? Um, I think Pico Alto to me, um, Pico Alto in Peru is, it's probably my favorite wave to surf, um, because it's got so many, I mean, it's like a point break. It's got, it's a reef break and there's got three sections on it and it, it holds any size wave. I mean, it doesn't get surfed as much It's not very crowded and, um, uh, it'll, it'll hold an 80 foot wave. I mean, the reef yeah. just goes out. It's a 45 minute paddle out and the reef just I've got three full-on bottom turns on my rail th- three times on one wave, and you know I don't. You know, it's a lot of a lot of surfing. Yeah. It's like rink on or something. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And last question is, where is the next big wave discovery? I like to say, like, where is the next Nazare? You know, where it just comes out of the blue and it's this amazing giant wave. And where do you think that is? Well, I, I'm not quite sure because Nazare is a really uh, unique combination of bathymetry and, and swell angle and everything else. I, I don't know if there's another one like Nazare that exists. Is it To me, it's like the eighth wonder of the world. It's If you're a surfer, you got to go there. But I think probably the next big, big wave that we're going to be able to really enjoy and appreciate is probably somewhere in Morocco. Mm. I just, yeah. the direction, the directions of all those North Atlantic swells and it just, it just faces the swell direction. And I think, I know there's some slabs down there that some of the guys are riding, but uh, I think there's probably a, a, a great big wave there. Yeah, for sure. Good, good answer. 
Well, Gary, thank you so much, buddy. That was um, that was awesome. I love getting the history of uh, not just big wave surfing, but surfing as well. And um, from the bottom of my heart and everyone else, thank you for what you've done. Um, thank you for, you know, letting us to be where we are today because if it wasn't for you and your your drive, your passion, um, your vision, then, you know, there would be no big wave tour and we probably would be working nine to five jobs. So, um Thank you so much. We really appreciate you and um, I'm stoked you could come on the Big Wave podcast. Thank you, Jamie. It, it means a lot coming from you. You know, you're, you're a champion and uh, I have so much respect for you. And I just look forward to days, you know, I'm not done yet. Let's, let's keep this ball rolling, buddy. And uh, I'm, I'm counting on you to take the torch here. So, <laughs> All right, Gary. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Take care. And um, you're back in the shaping bay? Yeah, I might go over there and work on some uh, agave boards right now. Just to nice, clear nice. my mind a little bit. All right, mate. <laughs> All right. Take care of yourself. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. See ya.